It is my pleasure to introduce Papia and Jojo. They are both threat hunters at Wit Secure. They are presenting the virtuous cycle of hunt focused purple teaming. Thank you, Courtney, for the introduction. Um, yeah, we're, um, today we're going to be talking about um, what we mean by uh, the virtuous cycle of hunt focused purple teaming, um, what it kind of means to us. Um, in Whistaker's managed detection and resp response team um, through the lens of a specific piece of research that we did earlier this year into OneNote. Okay, so just some quick introductions. Um, my name is Poppy McDermott. Uh, I've been a threat hunter in Whistaker's detection and response team based in London for about two years now. Um, I don't know if that's really loud, is that? But, um, <laughs> it's, uh, I have a physics background and I'm particularly interested in, in um, kind of using data science techniques to improve detection and response workflows. Uh, my name's Jojo O'Gorman. Similar to Poppy, I've been a threat hunter uh, with, with Secure for about two years now. Um, I'm really passionate about collaborative projects, so I run kind of purple team style exercises with some of our red team consultants, trying to bring kind of red teamers and blue teamers together, which is something we're going to talk about today. Cool. Uh, so what we're going to cover, um, yeah, as mentioned, we're going to discuss with Secure's approach to collaborative purple teaming exercises from our point of view as threat hunters. And we're going to do this through a specific case study into OneNote abuse, which we began researching in late 2022. Um, but this gained traction in the first uh, quarter of 2023 as attackers changed up their initial delivery mechanisms to use OneNote. So, um, Going through that case study, we'll cover how we simulated exploitation uh, with various test cases, uh, how we then went through devising some threat hunting hypotheses, um, and then just some examples of data visualization to isolate those outliers. And then we'll take a brief look into some kind of detection engineering improvements, um, and then go through some lessons learned and key takeaways from this way of working. So <coughs> what is the Purple Team Virtuous Cycle? Well, First of all, purple teaming itself can mean a lot of things from organization to organization. It's a bit of an um, ambiguous term, but all we're referring to here is like detection capability assessments carried out in a collaborative manner um, with team members from the blue side, so defenders, and from the offensive side, so red teams or uh, security consultants or pen testers, whatever you want to call people. So why might we want to work in this purple-minded manner? Um, in a kind of, well, any organizations that are fortunate enough to have several separate specialist security teams, so thinking things like security operations under threat hunters, um, maybe threat intelligence, red team, um, they may fall into, they may kind of face issues with entrenched silos. So um, there may actually be like a total lack of communication between these teams. This of course leads to knowledge gaps and people kind of get stuck in these static silos. Um, and also, yeah, workflows can be completely separate, which then obviously leads to duplicated efforts. Um, so we can remedy this by working in like a more cyclical purple team manner. So this is what we've got shown here in this cycle. So the first stage is um, running these attack simulations uh, and then moving that, uh, kind of moving those results into threat hunting. So taking indicators from those purple team test kit, test executions uh, and yeah, creating some hypotheses off that. Um, then moving into like some rule development uh, in the detection engineering phase. And then finally closing off the cycle with um, knowledge sharing and kind of going over any limitations we might have found during this process uh, or any future work streams. So obviously we can see this is a positive feedback loop. Um, so this helps us, uh, all these different teams, to share knowledge. Uh, as of course, we know attack techniques inform defensive strategies and vice versa. So this helps defenders and defensive team members um, kind of broaden their skill set and um, strengthen their skills and just kind of helps them test their skills. Um, so yeah, this also reduces duplicated effort in research and development. And finally, it can support learning beyond those static job roles. So um, 
enables interflow between these teams. So over a long term, this can even allow for things like secondments to the red team or secondments to threat hunting, uh, or for people to act as surge capacity for threat hunters, for example. Uh, so of course, all of this is good for individual growth um, and team growth, but it's also good for the business itself. Um, so yeah, now we have an idea of what this virtual cycle is, we're gonna introduce our case study. So we're going to highlight how we implement some of the ideas that Poppy's just mentioned um, by running through our methodology for a particular piece of research that we conducted at the beginning of this year. Um, so what kind of brought our attention to um, OneNote exploitation? Um, there were many kind of articles and blog posts um, into um, Microsoft um, bring, introducing some stricter measures to deter the improper use of macro-enabled documents in kind of the summer of 2022. Um, so macro-enabled documents are often used as um, attachments in phishing email campaigns. Um, and Microsoft introduced these measures to kind of deter the improper use um, of them. The measures they introduced were basically to um, apply a mark of the web to macro-enabled documents. Um, all that mark of the web is is basically an additional file um, that defines the zone identifier of the document. Um, the Windows operating system basically uses that mark of the web to um, label the file as having come from the internet, so from a browser or an email. Um, it's what things like Defender Smart Screen Tool uses to block content. Um, it's what the operating system uses to kind of warn users about executing or opening um, particular file types. Um, and it basically prevented um, the kind of execution of payloads through this method in kind of phishing campaigns. Um, so we, because of this, we saw um, malware campaigns um, moving to different methods of payload delivery. Um, obviously, they're kind of looking for different file types they can attach to, to phishing emails to be able to distribute their payloads. Um, taking Quackbot as an example, so it was a trend between um, across like a whole load of malware campaigns, but as, as an example, um, Quackbot moved from using Office macros to zipped disk image files, so um, at the time Mark of the Web wasn't applied to kind of files within a disk image, um, so they could attach these and get users to interact with them and, and execute them um, without them being blocked by the operating system. Again, Microsoft introduced or, or um, patched this, so now Mark of the Web is applied to these files. So again, we saw kind of an evolution of, of these malware campaigns moving to different payload delivery mechanisms. In this case, they moved to using OneNote. So why in particular um, um, did, was there a move to using OneNote? Um, there's kind of a few crucial points here, but um, they can contain embedded portable executable files. Um, there's a kind of a whole list of different file types that you can embed in a OneNote file. Um, and they can also have external hyperlinks. Um, and both of those thing, things can be formatted to make, kind of entice the user to interact with it, similar to how um, emails are kind of formatted for, um, in phishing campaigns so that users interact with them. Um, it's also installed by default on most modern Windows OSs, so and a kind of 0365 installations. So even if a user doesn't in, uh, actively use OneNote, um, they'll be able to open OneNote files, which is kind of what threat actors are looking for when they're looking at file types to put, you know, introduce in their phishing campaigns. They want users to be able to actually open and execute their payloads. So another kind of reason why they choose to use this. Um, and then crucially, the last point, um, Mark of the Web was not propagated to embedded files within a OneNote file. Um, so kind of at the time, this meant that you could attach a macro-enabled document into a OneNote file, and it would bypass those, those measures that Microsoft brought in. Um, there's a star there because this is not the case anymore. Um, Mark of the Web is applied to all attachments in a OneNote file. Um, kind of at the time, the articles um, and blog posts, there's a particular one by Emmerich Nazi, which kind of researched this at the time, brought our attention to this. Um, they stated that uh, Mark of the Web wasn't applied. Um, so we kind of identified this technique. We think it's worthy of investigation. And now we're going to start the kind of more collaborative purple team exercise part of this, this stage, um, where we want to assess our detection capability of it. OK, 
Okay, um, so the first step that we want to take whenever we want to investigate any kind of new, new tool or technique um, in a purple teaming exercise is to gain like, a contextual understanding of the legitimate usage of, of this tool. So this is where we get to utilize our kind of huge existing data corpus um, across all our customer environments from our EDR agent. Um, so using that data, we can understand, first of all, the normal behavior of OneNote. So here we're thinking things like, what are the general behavior of OneNote's child processes? Are there any, what are the profiles of those child processes? Are there any particular types of processes that are spawned by OneNote? What might we expect? Um, you know, people might, you might kind of posit that people will open PDF readers with OneNote, that kind of thing, but they're not likely to open um, WScript. So, um, yeah, you might kind of look at maybe the top 10 most seen child processes, um, things like network connections of OneNote or, you know, does it make network connections at all, that kind of thing. Um, and we'll kind of note down those, those top 10 most seen processes, things like that, uh, for when we're kind of looking at detection engineering later, it's good to have that baseline already. So the next point is typical usage. So how do users normally use OneNote? Of course, we know it's a note-taking tool, but are there any kind of interesting or surprising use cases uh, or edge cases? Uh, this is something that always crops up for us um, as threat hunters. We kind of triage tickets and things that like system administrators and users will always surprise you with the ways that they use uh, any tools. Uh, we might think, why, why is a batch script being run from inside a OneNote file? But that might be, that might be intentional. Um, so it's good to have an awareness of that and what is considered standard on particular customer environments and then note that down. Uh, next thing is data coverage. So what data feeds do we have available? So what I'm referring to here is telemetry being streamed from our EDR agent. Um, but this could also be any kind of logs you might have from Sysmon or whatever. We might already have at this point kind of an idea of the requirements that we have for detecting exploitation of OneNote. Uh, so this might be things like, yeah, the, pro the process is created by OneNote, the file's created by OneNote, but here's where we can highlight any visibility issues that we might have to the tools team or the relevant team. So this might be something like, um, we have logs for file creation, but we don't have them for every, t you know, every relevant file type, that kind of thing. Um, so all of this helps us to profile the normal usage of OneNote, and as I mentioned, this helps feed into later noise removal and detection engineering, but this also kind of generally helps us learn about our environment and our customer environments. So kind of continuing on our collaborative purple team exercise, the next thing we want to do after we have a kind of contextual understanding um, is think about what what the threat is that we're trying to emulate. Um, so this is just kind of an example of the, the stages that we might expect to see. So the first thing is that a user's gonna double click on an embedded object within a OneNote file. Once they've done that, um, they'll be prompted with this warning message which basically warns them that opening an attachment could be harmful. All they need to do is click OK to that um, and OneNote will write the embedded file um, to a temporary directory, uh, the one you can see there. Um, and then it will launch launch the file, the executable file. It may need to, to execute a lol bin, so a living off the land binary to do that. Um, but these are kind of the steps we would expect to see um, for execution. Cool, so now we have a general idea of what the execution chain will look like. We now wanna consider specific test cases. So um, yeah, as mentioned at the time that we started the research, many types of executable scripts and files were kind of available to execute through OneNote. Um, Microsoft has now, uh, I think, banned 122 different file extensions from being like double clicked within OneNote. Um, so yeah, the whole host of very esoteric ones. We've just got a few of the big, the big ones on the screen here. So um, of course, you've got like the simple cases like just embedding a PE, or you could even embed a macro-enabled document within OneNote. And at the time when Mark of the Web wasn't being propagated, that was kind of cool because then you didn't have Mark of the Web on your micro-enabled document. But we could also um, embed things like HDA. Um, and any files like this, you can double-click them. And they require a living off the land binary to execute. So 
um, Windows will automatically get OneNote to launch that living off land binary. Um, so just as some context, a living off land binary is a legitimate trusted Microsoft uh, executable. Um, so if, uh, and it's being abused in some way to proxy execution or to download a file, for example. Um, generally with OneNote, it was a proxy execution. Um, and of course, this is attractive to threat actors as these executables are ubiquitous on all modern Windows installations. And of course, they want to maximize their chance of their payload uh, execution chain uh, succeeding. So we want to emulate um, this threat by covering as many of these file types as possible. And this kind of gives us, uh, this list of processes kind of gives us an idea for when we go to threat hunting that these living off the land binaries may prove maybe more interesting as child processes of OneNote, as we may have found earlier that OneNote doesn't generally launch MSI exec or things like that. Um, So this is now where we get to the, like, the most collaborative part of this section. So um, we have an idea about the exploitation chain. We know about kind of some of the test cases that we want to, to execute. Um, and this, it was at this point that we collaborated with a red team consultant. So Ricardo Ancarani is a consultant that I've, I work with on kind of purple team um, exercises. He'd already been looking into this as well. So we decided to kind of collaborate on this. And he provided us with um, a OneNote file with a whole load of test cases. So those payloads you can see on the right-hand side. Um, so we could basically then had a, a payload um, for each of these different file types um, to execute. Um, we ran each of these in a controlled environment with our EDR agent um, to kind of collect as much data as we could whilst we were executing these. Um, you could use an alternative, something like Sysmon, Procmon um, or Silk ETW, um, something to collect that data and then store it somewhere. So I forward it onto kind of an Elk stack or something like that. Um, I just want to highlight at this point, so kind of the reason why we're working in this collaborative manner is that we're able to, as blue teamers, get kind of experience in running these offensive techniques. In this case, it's kind of quite a simple example, but it can involve like us learning a completely new skill. Um, it also gives our red teamers an, an opportunity to look at kind of detection and, and maybe kind of rehearse some of the playbooks that they can then go and use on future engagements. Um, it may have been that we didn't kind of cover all of these test cases without, without having that offensive insight from, from our red team consultants. Um, so it's kind of, yeah, really beneficial to work in this way. Okay. Um, so now that we've executed our test cases, uh, we want to validate the data that's going to be available to us for detection building later on. Um, so I've just got some examples up here of the types of EDR telemetry that we get from our agent. Um, so yeah, as mentioned, alternative tooling setups are of course available. But this kind of shows the benefit of having an EDR agent because of the breadth of telemetry that you're going to get. So you've got things up there that are relevant to detecting memory an anomalies, such as like re you know reflective loading and like unbacked threads in memory and things like that. But of course, we're not really bothered about that in this case because um, the OneNote exploitation is fairly simple. So we're probably looking more at the things like process creation, which uh, for us we call it new process, and file creation or modification, which here is file access. Um, but you can also see we have plenty of other events for like. Yeah, you know, module loading and Windows event log, that kind of thing. So just to go through um, kind of an arbitrary example of what some telemetry might look like. Um, so the analyst double clicks the OneNote file in downloads, new process event for Explorer to open OneNote. Uh, we then get the analyst double clicking the payload that's embedded within the OneNote file. In this case, it's a compiled HTML helper file, CHM. So we then see OneNote creating that file in that temporary directory mentioned earlier. Um, because the user has double-clicked the embedded payload, uh, OneNote launches the relevant living off the land binary to execute that payload, which in this case is htmlhelper.exe. So we get another new process event for that. And then finally, uh, we've got kind of an example of like a resultant process chain from that payload being executed. So here this is just a simple CMD to execute who am I. Um, but this is just like an arbitrary example to show 
um, kind of, yeah, the process command line that you would get, that kind of thing. Um, yeah, so this is kind of, yeah, this is just arbitrary. It could be anything in that command line. It could be curl or wscript, for example. So just to kind of recap on, I guess, where we've been so far on this virtuous cycle, um, we've been able to collaborate with um, our red team consultants to run a threat emulation um, to kind of produce real data that we can then utilize um, to pass on into the threat hunting phase. So we've been able to collaborate with our security consultants, but also we may have had the opportunity to collaborate with other teams, such as like a tools team, if we've highlighted data visibility issues or something like that. Um, and we've kind of been able to produce this data set of a real technique, which we can then use to inform um, or develop hypotheses for threat hunting, which is kind of the next stage in our cycle. Yeah, so now we're gonna go through the kind of general threat hunting methodology that we follow. Um, as the next stage in our virtuous cycle. So of course the first step is to formulate some threat hunting hypotheses. This could be, um, as I was kind of hinting at earlier, just things like unusual child processes of OneNote. Um, so we want to formulate these, these hypotheses based off of the indicators from the test case execution, and we kind of want to avoid uh, like IOC driven stuff. Uh, we kind of want to go for more behavioral um, threat hunting hypotheses. The next step is then running that search over our wider data corpus in order to gather a data set. Um, but as mentioned, this could also just be gathering some logs. The next thing we want to do is baseline our initial results and um, yeah, identify what's normal and just try and disregard some common behavior just to try and reduce that data set size to something that's more manageable. Um, we can decide what's normal based either on frequency, so as I mentioned earlier, things like top 10 most seen processes, probably not that interested in those. But we can also utilize um, some machine learning classifiers which will help us distinguish what's common, what's rare. Um, and yeah, here is an, an, also an opportunity for us to note down kind of potential causes of false positives in the future uh, for any kind of detection rules that come out of this research, uh, which of course this makes detection engineering more efficient, this saves us time down the line. But, being able to identify those causes of false positives um, requires like domain knowledge on the part of the analyst and also operational experience of dealing with tickets and also writing detection rules and tuning them. Next point is identifying anomalies. So I think broadly, I'd say there's two types of detection. So like discrete indicators, like I mentioned like IOCs, and then anomaly detection. We're gonna go through kind of more of the latter and I'll go through that a bit in the next slide. So. All of this allows us to like, uncover some anomalies that are worthy of review in our customer environments. Um, so of course, we'll triage any of those and raise them or, and remediate them if needed. Uh, but the whole way through this process, we will have been looking to try and identify rule opportunities uh, from any repeatable threat hunts and um, assess the feasibility of creating detection logic based on these threat hunts uh, and also asking ourselves like what possible, what severity could any rule be, how noisy would it be, that kind of thing. So from this kind of list of steps, we're gonna skip into a type of anomaly-based hunting uh, called least frequency hunting, and then after that, we'll discuss some specific hunting hypotheses. So the overall hypothesis here is simply that suspicious activity is atypical. So if we hunt for infrequently occurring events, then we can, that can yield uh, interesting results that are worthy of review. So as a, an example, a high frequency of network connections from a small number of processes to an unusual domain could indicate beaconing, but of course that requires um, kind of inspection. Um, so the example that I have here is, a, is MSI exec, which is one of the lulbins I mentioned earlier, making outbound network connections and I split that by top level domain and ordered it by the number of unique hosts that these events have been seen on. Um, so yeah, the hypothesis there is just that kind of less capable threat actors are likely to host their payloads or their command and control servers on these cheap domains like XYZ or ZIP or whatever. Um, so we can kind of make, kind of postulate that uh, these very 
unusual TLDs may be nefarious. Uh, so here we can see .com, as you'd expect, is by far the most, most seen. Um, but then we have a few kind of interesting ones down at the bottom. Um, and .tw is actually, I think, a, like a failed execution of a Raspberry Robin USB worm, because uh, that tends to be MSI exec. Um, so you can see how just doing like a sim simply splitting the data set on one characteristic here has allowed that rare event to kind of fall out at the bottom. Um, so I'll just take you through the general approach here. So we're going to assume we already have a data set of some sort, so EDR or logs, and we found that from our previous search. The first thing we might want to do is create some new features. So like top, top level domain there, we're not going to have that in our characteristics to begin with. We're going to have to split that out from the full domain. Uh, but you might also want to run some regular expressions and remove user-specific information, that kind of thing, just to help us flatten the data set a little bit more, which will help us when we're doing some aggregations later on. Um, we've already done some noise reduction, but we're going to do some more aggressive noise reduction now, uh, because, yeah, if you have a really big data set, this is kind of painful otherwise. Um, so, yeah, we're, again, just disregarding normal behavior. Uh, and then we kind of move into this split, apply, combine strategy of data analysis. So we want to split by um, relevant telemetry characteristics. So uh, this could be just by one or by multiple to create uh, these groups. Uh, so this could be as simple as splitting by process name or process path or command line, or we could even bring in file metadata like the process signer. Uh, of course, for network data, we want to look at domain name or TLD. Uh, the next thing we want to do is apply some kind of function to these groups. Here, we're just going to simply get um, the unique host count, so how many unique hosts has it been seen on over this time period, um, and then review the rarest groups. So the outcome of this is that we can identify events that have fallen under our alerting threshold. So this could be due to a couple of things. This could be failed execution, as I mentioned earlier, or it could actually be a true detection coverage gap. And this allows us to then identify those blind spots and remediate them. So we can feed back this into an iterative detection improvement process. Um, and just generally, like uh, finding malicious activity via multiple distinct paths this validates our approach, and it also kind of just strengthens our learning. It helps us learn about our environment. But I just want to stress here that it's, yeah, you're not going to find something every time, and it's less important to find true bad every time, but more important that we're kind of we're learning about our environment, our customer environments, uh, and the cyber threat landscape in general, um, and that we're learning to kind of generate better hypotheses in the future and just become better threat hunters. Um, I'll just go through a couple of limitations here. Big data problem. So yeah, so this is pretty e easy to implement in something like Jupyter Notebook or dashboards if you have like Elasticsearch or whatever. Um, but unless you have quite complex hypotheses or you've applied very aggressive noise reduction, you might end up, or, or you've gone over a very small time period, you might end up with a really unmanageable data set size. But of course, this is a issue that's probably known to a lot of us as a common in cybersecurity. Um, and then, oh. Skipping that. Um, and then the second thing is just that findings from threats can be difficult to adapt to any kind of automated alerting. Um, yeah, they might not map kind of one to one onto rules, but that's okay, really. We, I think it's fine for some things to stay as Jupyter notebooks that we run every so often, because um, it might just, yeah, require kind of visual inspection to decide what's good, what's bad. Um, yeah. yeah, now that we. Yeah, have an idea about the way that we're going to threat hunt. I'm going to go through some specific threat hunting hypotheses. Yeah, so I'm going to take you through a specific hypothesis that we came up with this OneNote research. Um, so we discussed earlier that um, threat actors are kind of likely to use living off the land binaries to execute their payloads because you know they're ubiquitous. They're ubiquitous on Windows installations. They know they're going to be there. They don't have to kind of install any other software to be able to execute these file types. So we can assume that they're going to be likely to use them. We also know that OneNote is going to have to launch these programs to be able to execute those file types. So we might come up with a hypothesis that OneNote launching a Windows native binary is worthy of review. 
Um, so I've just got kind of an example um, data set here. Um, so this pie chart in the center is showing kind of um, child processes of OneNote within a particular time frame. And the kind of largest sections there you can see is, are going to be our baseline. So these are the events that happen most frequently, all of the processes that OneNote um, executes all the time. Um, we can kind of, yeah, exclude this as our baseline. This is like normal behavior. Things like Windows error fault, those kind of things are going to be seen all the time. The bit that we are interested in is this smallest section of this, of this pie, which is blown up on the right-hand side. Um, so these are the events that happen the least frequently. Um, you can see we've got MSHTA there, hh.exe, um, and these are truly malicious cases. So we've been able to kind of pull them out straight away by just looking at how, they, how frequently they occur. Another example there is WScript. So that's five instances of that. It's relatively rare compared to the whole data set, but we might need to bring in another field of our data um, to kind of determine if each, each of those five cases are truly malicious or not. Um, but you can just see from looking at kind of just at this example, um, that it's quite easy to kind of pick out some truly malicious cases by just looking at the least frequency, frequently occurring items. Um, then just to kind of illustrate this, we've got a real example of QuackBot. So this was picked up by our EDR agent um, in February 2023. Um, just to kind of show you the process chain here. So on the left-hand side, um, it's visualized with our in-house tool called Detectory. So this basically visualizes detected processes kind of in terms of their activity. So other processes they launch, files they, they access or modify, network connections that are made. And then the colors there you can see are basically based on the severity of the detections um, to do with those activities. Um, but it's also kind of illustrated on the right-hand side. So um, in this example, um, the QuackPot um, payload was an MA, a HTA file embedded in a OneNote um, file. Um, so it launched curl to download a DLL. It's kind of spoofed as a .gif there and saved as a PNG, but it's a DLL file. Um, we then saw the HTA file execute run DLL32 to um, execute a function from within that DLL. And then finally, it launched task kill to, to kill the parent MSHTA process. Um, so I'm just kind of showing you this here because we may find from, from doing our least frequency hunting that one note launching MSHTA is rare, but we can't confidently say it's malicious every single time. Um, but if we start to look at, okay, what about the child processes of MSHTA? We also see that those are quite anomalous. We've got MSHTA launching curl and run DLL32, which isn't very common. Um, and what we can do is kind of chain together those um, parent and child process pairs. Um, and we, if we see that kind of um, future child processes um, are also anomalous, then we can kind of increase our, how confident we are about the overall detection chain being truly malicious. Um, so just an example there. Of, of yeah, how important it is to kind of chain those um, anomalies together um, and how it can be beneficial to kind of produce more effic efficient um, or, or more confidently say that the entire detection chain is, is truly malicious. Okay, so um, second threat hunting hypothesis we're gonna go through. Uh, if we're thinking we're gonna go backwards in the execution chain now rather than forwards, if we start thinking about initial delivery mechanisms, um, we know from threat intelligence and our own operational experience that things like Quackbot and Emotet are delivered via phishing emails, of course. And if you think about it, um, email is like a natural conduit for OneNote documents to be disseminated the same way that it is for other kind of maldocs like Excel documents, that kind of thing. So we can then form like a, um, a simple search or a simple kind of hypothesis that if we look for the process ancestry, Outlook EXE to OneNote EXE to another child process, um, this, yeah, this is worthy of review. Uh, of course, this is somewhat naive as, of course, users could open their emails from their web client or from any other kind of email client, but um, Outlook is by far the uh, most popular solution in enterprise. So. Uh, this is an acceptable limitation for a first-pass search. So I'll just take you through uh, the examples of this search uh, and the way I've visualized them here. So the, this is a bubble chart. The um, 
x-axis is the process prevalence reputation scores. So this is one of the classifiers that I mentioned earlier. This runs from unknown on the right-hand side to trusted on the left-hand side. Uh, so this is kind of taken into account things like, is this a signed binary? Uh, how, how many times has this been seen before on this estate? How many times has it been seen before globally? That kind of thing. And it packages that into a score. Uh, the y-axis, we've got the process relationship rarity. This is how commonly is this parent process launching this child. Because we're just looking at one note, this is effectively how commonly is one note launching this child process. And this runs from common at the bottom to rare at the top. Uh, and then the size of the bubble, is, the radius of the bubble, is, is proportional to the number of unique hosts that this process relationship has been observed on over this 30-day period. So. We can kind of, yeah, from that, we, can, we know that we want to look at the top of the, the graph to look for our unusual things. So we can see these massive bubbles at the bottom left. This is our baseline. So this is the case of OneNote launching trusted processes, which it commonly launches. So these are all the things that we would probably come up with ourselves, PDF readers, web browsers, um, other Microsoft Office uh, products seems pretty, some, pretty normal for OneNote to launch those things. So we're not that interested in that. Uh, the top right, we have the simple case of somebody embedding a low prevalence executable, so a payload inside uh, OneNote, and that being executed um, via a, fish, a phishing infe infection vector. Uh, again, that's pretty simple. I'm not that interested in that. The, on the top left, however, we have the living off the land binary um, case. So we can see that while WScript and HH.exe um, are trusted because they are Microsoft processes, they are very, very rare for OneNote to launch. So we are interested in that relationship. Uh, and then you've got Werfelt in the middle there, which we've discussed already is not particularly interesting. That's error reporting. Um, yeah, sorry to OneNote. Sorry to Werfelt. I'm <laughs> ragging on you. But, um, yeah, so just want to stress that this is a general hunt idea, and we could apply this to many different types of applications or data sets. Um, and from this, we've kind of gained an idea of the filters and searches that we need to do to isolate malignancy. And we've noted down uh, what we know to be our baseline uh, kind of results uh, and what's going to cause us false positives. We can now move to creating some detection rules. Yeah, so through running our kind of collaborative purple team that informed our um, threat hunting hypothesis, we've been able to then um, kind of take some of those high fidelity threat hunts and hopefully turn them into um, detection rules, which is the next stage of this cycle, so detection engineering. Um, the aim here is that we want to try and take kind of our really high fidelity hunts that have produced a really good rate of finding true positive as opposed to false positive um, and kind of apply a severity based on that ratio. Um, we want kind of the ones, so these are the things that we're going to be wanting to execute kind of regularly um, because they produce good results, they're successful. Um, and we want to be able to automate that by, by creating a detection rule. Um, got some ideas here on the left hand side um, about the kind of philosophy we want to adopt when we're writing rules. Um, I'll just pick out a few important things. Firstly, we kind of mentioned it before, but um, we're aiming for behavior-based rules as opposed to kind of signature-based um, rules, IOCs, like looking at hashes and file names and things like that, because those things are brittle. They're going to start failing when these execution chains, um, chains are kind of modified by threat actors. Um, and we want our rules to kind of be long-lasting and kind of survive those future changes. So we're going to going to opt for um, behavior-based um, ideas instead. Um, and we can try and use kind of more complex ideas like um, combining different events, um, correlating them together um, to produce a more um, kind of confident idea about, uh, about malignancy, combine them together in our detection logic as, as well. Um, there's an example on the right-hand side. So this is pseudocode um, for kind of looking at that anomalous child process um, idea. Um, so this is a new process event where the parent process is OneNote and we're looking at the child process um, having a path within system 32, so basically a Windows native binary, um, combining that with the process relationship being rare um, 
in reality, that kind of will be a thresholded score that we will have um, determined through doing our hunting. Um, but basically, that's just going to get rid of all of that baseline um, because we're saying this relationship is really rare, never seen um, like legitimately for one note. Um, we can then combine that um, with the idea that I mentioned earlier about kind of looking at the further child processes, whether they've also got detections or how anomalous they are. If we combine that with this detection, then we can kind of increase the overall um, severity and kind of be more confident that this is a truly malicious case. Um, but yeah, the idea here is, is I guess, less is more. Um, we want to try and create really high fidelity rules um, rather than just like loads of really brittle rules that are going to, you know, kind of not stand the test of time. Um, and yeah, it's just kind of a natural outcome of our threat hunting stage. Um, but we don't, but yeah, it's okay if this doesn't happen. Like Poppy mentioned, we can kind of go back and, and just keep hunting ideas as hunting ideas um, if it doesn't gener kind of naturally um, convert into a rule um, naturally. Uh, whoops. <laughs> Animation as well. <laughs> Uh, okay, so we're kind of coming to the end of our virtuous cycle now. Uh, so we kind of touched on a lot of these points the whole way through, but there are many kind of value, valuable outputs and outcomes of, of, of this way of working. And rules are not the be-all and end-all. Uh, so up to this point uh, in the research cycle, we might have formed some strong data-driven threats, whether that be in Jupyter notebooks or in, our, in some dashboards. Uh, and it's nice because these are shareable and collaborative, and we can keep working on these and updating them, and um, you know, feeding back into them based on the results that we get. The next thing we might have devised some new or improved test cases or playbooks for future Purple Team testing. We might also have improved our documentation or knowledge bases on things like attack techniques or detection uh, detection engineering uh, techniques. Uh, we might have engineered some rules, if appropriate. Uh, and then finally, we might have noted down, well, this is probably the most important thing, that we might have noted down any pain points, limitations that we found, or any future work streams for discussion. So I just want to go through some key points here. Uh, all of these outcomes, of course, should be tracked. Uh, and these should be tracked for each purple teaming topic. Uh, and each purple teaming topic should also be linked to kind of strategic research priorities that are um, discussed in uh, in collaboration with these other teams uh, for you know, each quarter, for example. This could be as simple as things like X new rules were created as a result of this, or you know, Y changes to rules were made, or Z changes proposed to one of the classifier models that, that we have, for example. The next thing is cross-team visibility. So things like test data should be visible to the red team and to any other teams that are interested. Um, uh, within reason, of course. Um, and also, the research tickets should be shared, uh, or any of the kind of research documentation should be shared, uh, just to try and help break down some of those barriers, like literally just not being able to look at the work. Um, and the final thing, which is really important, is having regular catch-up sessions and, and knowledge sharing sessions. So here I've put quarterly, um, but of course, it's just whatever works in the organization. Uh, so strong communication channels should be set up between each team. Um, yeah, where we can discuss, uh, as I mentioned, future strategic research priorities and things like that. So just to recap kind of where we've been on this virtuous cycle again. So um, we've been able to successfully collaborate with our security consultants to emulate a threat, produce a real kind of data set on a technique um, and then feed that into um, our threat hunting stage where we develop hypotheses based on that data set. Um, that has allowed us to potentially do some detection engineering, kind of turn those high fidelity threat hunts into rules that can automate that hunting for us. And then finally, we've been able to share knowledge, kind of learned from each of those stages back into this cycle. So we may have been able to inform further research projects or kind of Share, share knowledge or intelligence with other teams. You know, we may have had the opportunity to work with security consultants, our tools team, but also pass on information to threat intelligence, or like Poppy mentioned, to our data scientists that are working on these kind of machine learning classifiers. So yeah, it kind of just shows like 
the broad spectrum of people we've been able to involve here and how far kind of this knowledge that we've learned has been able we've been able to share that Cool. So just to summarize everything that we've spoken about today, we're going to go through some key lessons learned. Uh, and these form our reasoning for adopting this cyclical method of working. Um, and we'll kind of explain how we've sol kind of solved some of the issues that, that were introduced by traditional structures that I mentioned at the start. So the first point is intelligence. So um, generally, knowledge from other teams drives research. Um, so as an example that was discussed earlier, so offensively minded consultants uh, can drive kind of more creative ideas of testing detection capability than perhaps um, the blue team by, or by themselves may have come up with. Um, and of course, this in turn as well helps the red team test their, their OPSEC and how well they're going to be detected by um, kind of an EDR agent. Um, feeding this intelligence to other teams um, helps kind of create actionable items but on the back of that as of course as I mentioned earlier attack techniques inform defensive strategies and vice versa so all of this can be fed back into um, the strategic research priorities which um, can also be informed by threat intelligence or red team you know they'll know what are the emerging techniques um, what's kind of highest priority for us to start looking into and creating you know creating threat hunts on the top of, on top of and uh, rules on for example this also just helps avoid duplicated effort as yeah we're not doing the same research in two different places at the same time uh, and as I mentioned just kind of sharing that data um, and sharing those tickets you might you know you don't want to be in the situation where yeah you, you do some research and then you find that somebody did it a year ago and you're like why did I do that uh, <laughs> Um, yeah, the next thing, it, interdisciplinary models, so the whole way through this cycle, um, this will have been the same analysts kind of that have been working on this research, like an end-to-end -end project. So it's really about trusting analysts or threat hunters, in, in our case, on those end-to-end -end projects. And this spans kind of basically several different disciplines in cybersecurity. Um, so this, yeah, empowers that analyst and kind of Imp just improves improves skills in general, of course, um, because that helps you become a better detection engineer. It helps you generate better hunting hypotheses, uh, and it's also great um, that the if the analyst has had kind of experience of triage, like ticket triage, uh, containment, remediation, some kind of incident response, this is also great to feed back into threat hunting and detection engineering. So just the last couple of items here. Um, the next thing is about robust feedback. So um, producing all this data and intelligence is really great, but it's kind of more important about how we utilize it. We want to make sure that we're feeding the information we've learned at each stage um, into kind of future iterations of this cycle. So we may want to do kind of regression testing um, to kind of check that you know the new rules that we've created are working properly. Um, as Poppy mentioned, we might want to threat hunt again to kind of confirm our hypotheses, like find malicious activity through multiple ways. Um, we also kind of want to, along the way, be threat hunting um, for our specific rule ideas um, to check the feasibility of these rules, make sure we found that baseline and introduced kind of um, allow listing or whatever it might be kind of early on before those rules go into production so that we're kind of reducing false positives before um, before they go out into, into prod, um, just preventing the need to do that later on. Um, and it's, yeah, just important to kind of use the information we're learning along the way, um, as opposed to kind of, yeah, leaving it behind us. Um, and then the final point here is about collaboration. So I think, for me, this is kind of the most crucial part. Um, we've, through doing this, been able to foster an environment where collaboration just happens a bit more naturally. Um, you know, implementing successful means of cross-team communication, even if it seems quite trivial, you know, creating group chats and things like that, um, can be really important. It just allows people to, I guess, reach out to each other a bit more naturally and share, share information across teams. Um, you know, simple things like having a one-to-one -one introduction to members of another team well, I certainly find you're more likely to feel confident to go and ask them for help in something they've got expertise in if you've met them before or you've been introduced to them. Um, you know, sometimes 
layers of abstraction are important and necessary. We can't always do everything. Um, we may have to outsource a particular task to another team if we don't have capacity for it. But where we can, um, you know, we should try to uh, manage our teams in a way that allows us to say, hey, I asked you to do that thing. Can I shadow you whilst you do it? Or can you show me how, how I can do it? Um, because it just helps us to grow and, and spread that knowledge across, across our teams. Um, all of this kind of sparks creativity and an innovation, um, but kind of more importantly, it promotes this sense of belonging and, and community, which I think is kind of quite hard to um, develop in a remote working environment. Um, and I think that's, that's one of the most important things that we've certainly found as an outcome from doing this, is that, that collaborative um, atmosphere um, has been really good for, for um, kind of uh, developing that, that sense of community. Um, so yeah, these are just kind of a few of our, of our lessons learned and hopefully some key t takeaways, um, I guess, of things to think about when you want to um, implement collaborative projects yourselves. Um, yeah, we, I'll leave them up, um, but we do have some time, I think, for questions if anybody has questions. Yeah, go ahead. Um, yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so we'll certainly kind of when we're hunting with these hypotheses, when we come across like um, real examples of of malicious cases, um, we'll definitely collaborate. You know, with. Um, our customers or, or teams to kind of identify where there are issues. So obviously we want to work on like turning those hunting hypotheses into rules, but also it's important to identify kind of other issues that have come up from, from identifying that um, particular exploitation in the first place. Um, and yeah, we'll work to like um, highlight that as well. I guess it comes to that like data sharing or information sharing point. Um, you know, when we come across these things, we don't want to just keep those to ourselves. We want to share that with, with whoever it kind of we need to, we need to add. I was just going to say, I suppose as well, if we came across um, something that, yeah, was a, is a real gap just in terms of like a feature of the EDR agent, I, I think we mm. would try and, we'd try and start signpost that to the, the relevant team, which for us is the sensor development team. I know that's not, this isn't really relevant to anyone outside of other EDR and MDR providers, but um, yeah. yeah, I mean, your example, things with the proxy, we don't see things at that level. It's like ours, we're kind of endpoint, pro, yeah. like process telemetry, that kind of thing. And we do get uh, event tracing for Windows and some like system calls and things like that. Um, but I think, yeah, mo so on the MDR side, it is mostly yeah detecting th detecting things. But we're, we try to detect as early in kind of the kill chain as possible so that we can stop things from getting to oh, yeah, I think yeah, yeah something the, the quack bot that we showed earlier for example that well actually that wasn't us that was the EP so the, we have the e, it's a bit complicated our, our products but we have a thing called EPP which does have um, preventative uh, capabilities so there are particular you can create rules that will just kill that right. process chain and that's what happened there because in that quack bot example because um, otherwise that would have led to cobalt strike beacon but it got, ki it got killed at that mm -hmm. point um, but the point of our kind of managed, um, like managed service is that we're we're kind of we're the ones that we have to make a decision and, and kill things that aren't as um, kind of clear cut as that. Uh, mm. But yeah, sorry, I don't know if that answers your question. <laughs> <but>. <laughs> uh, anybody else? No, that's cool. Um, yeah, just want to say thank you all for coming yeah, and listening to us. Um, yeah, we'll. Well, we're around probably here for the social later, but yeah, come and chat to us if you do have questions. Thank you. Thanks.